Let's hear it for Paul Bacon. Okay, so uh, I used to uh, work as a police officer here in New York City. I was a patrolman in Harlem at the 28th Precinct, and uh, I worked the, the 4 p.m. to midnight tour. Um, and at the end of one of these tours, I, uh, I was told at the very last minute uh, that I had another tour to do from midnight until 8 a.m. So it would be a double shift. This is the kind of thing that happened when you're, when you're a rookie. Uh, you always get the last minute crappy job. And uh, so I got in my patrol car and I drove down to uh, One Police Plaza, which is the police headquarters in downtown Manhattan. It's a, it's a large campus. Uh, it has uh, lots of different security booths around the outside. And my job was to sit in one of those security booths all night, which sounds easy enough, but I was dead tired. Um, and I also had, uh, I, had a, I had a partner that I was going to be in that booth with the whole night. And uh, <clears throat> we had two different meal times. Uh, his was at 2 AM. Mine was at 3 AM, so that there would always be somebody at that post, because you know we're basically guarding the police department at this point. And uh, so there has to be somebody on there. And, uh, um, so, and also, as to what constitutes a meal hour uh, at 2 or 3 AM, it's, of course, as you might expect, a sleeping hour. Um, but that's totally prohibited. Uh, nobody, we're not allowed to sleep, but of course everybody did. And uh, uh, the punishment, if we were to get caught for sleeping on the job, it's, it's a minor violation, but uh, the, the, uh, the job, they take, they take away your vacation days. It's like the worst thing they could do to you uh, when you're working as a cop to have to work more as a cop. So, so um, <laughs> If you're late one day, maybe they'll take one vacation day. If you get caught sleeping, you know, they'll take a few vacation days. And I imagined that getting caught sleeping uh, when your job was to watch the fortress, I figured that would be like five, ten vacation days. So when it came my turn to sleep at 3 a.m., I got in my patrol car and I just sort of parked in a parking lot that was next to the security booth down a hill and around a corner a little bit. And uh, I found a slot uh, between two other police cars, and I just parked in there. And I thought, you know, <clears throat> nobody's going to see me. This is going to be fine. I'm in the tall cotton here. Nobody's going to see me. So oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to sleep in my car, but I can't sleep in the front seat because I can't sleep sitting up. I've never been able to sleep on airplanes. So I figured, well, you know what? I can stretch out in the back seat. So I, uh, I get in the back seat, close the door, lay down on my side, and I'm out like that because I've been so tired, and uh, I set my alarm for 4 a.m. Um, but like I do sometimes, I woke up just a little bit before my alarm, and it was like it was a, a, a chilling revelation inside of a dream. I didn't realize until I dreamed about it, what I had done is I'd locked myself inside. Because this is the back seat of a police car, and I knew that, I knew that what it's for, because I'd, trans I'd transported prisoners before in the back there, I know that we always have to let them out. <clears throat> and there are door handles. There are door handles on both sides, but they're purely decorative. And uh, <laughs> and uh, um, and I and if my partner could see me, if I could get his attention, he could just come let me out. It's really easy. Uh, but he's. Uh, close enough that I can see him and I can see what he's doing, but he's far enough away that he can't hear me screaming at him and he can't even hear me banging on the windows and I get my flashlight off my belt and I try to try to catch his attention, you know, just lighting up the side of his face. He's not seeing anything. Maybe he's sleeping too. Basically, he's out of the picture. So I, uh, I think, well, you know, I'm, usually when I'm in trouble, I go right for my radio when I reach for my radio, but it's not on my hip. I, left, I had left the radio in the front seat when I went in the back to sleep because I knew I was going to lay on my side, so I just took off my radio and my gun, and I, I placed them in the passenger seat, and I can see them. I can, like, look through the compartment. There's plexiglass. I can see my gun and my radio, the two most important things in my whole life right now, out of reach. <clears throat> and uh, about this time, a, uh, a Pepsi distributor truck pulls up in front of the parking lot, and... Uh, uh, I think, oh, this is great. I'm going to be saved. So um, when, when the, the driver gets out of the cab, I, I knock really hard on the window, and uh, he, I get his attention right away. Um, and he looks in my direction. Now, remember, it's, all, it's really dark where I am. It's just like a darkened parking lot. And uh, he doesn't see me. I can tell that, even though I, I'm, I'm making a lot of noise. So I take the flashlight again, and I point it like this. <laughs> <clears throat> This, uh, this makes the man very scared, and uh, there goes my only way out, because he gets in his truck and he drives away. 
I realized, I can see, you know, now I can see I should have shined the light on my past. Like, I'm a police officer on my shield, but no, I'm the face. I must have looked like a jack-o'-lantern. <laughs> Never saw him again. And uh, I didn't think I was going to see anybody else because it was like, it was like now four in the morning. It's the financial district. It's, it's Sunday. There's nobody out. So uh, I do have my cell phone on my belt. And um, I pick it up and I think, well, it'd be great if I had my partner's phone number uh, up in the booth. Maybe I could wake him up with a little ringtone, but uh, I don't even, I know, I just met him that night for the first time. I don't have his cell phone number. I can't call him in the booth because I don't know the booth number because I don't work in this precinct. Um, but I think maybe I could call my own precinct, okay, up in Harlem. It's about, it's about eight miles away. And I'd, I'd have to really sweet talk somebody into coming in and uh, uh, coming all the way downtown to come let me out of the car. And I know that if I tell anybody what's happened to me, it's, I'm never going to hear the end of it because I'm already a rookie, so you, know, you get a hard time just for showing up. And then it also, I also happen to be kind of a liberal. Uh, and uh, in the police department, you know, being a liberal, it's, like it's, 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 like it's impossible for you to do your job and be a liberal at the same time. <laughs> It's like I'm a tailor with no hands, and uh, <laughs> and I get a lot of I get a lot of flack for this, constant flack uh, for being a. But I was a closet liberal, you know. That's what they were always trying to out me as a liberal because I was always trying to hide it because I just wanted to blend in. Um, so I know I've already got these two strikes to get me, two strikes against me. So the third strike, they're getting locked in the back of the car. It's gonna be forget about it. I don't I don't even want to call the precinct. I, I'd rather just perish in the back of this car. Um, <laughs> And there is one number that I can call, and if I, do, if I call this number, you know, it's going to be guaranteed somebody's going to come help me. But it, I never really wanted to call 911 as a cop. <laughs> it didn't seem very professional somehow, but I have no other choice, so I, uh, so I, call, I call 911, and I let it ring, and I'm like, I'm like almost thinking, like, God, I hope they don't pick up, you know? Um, <laughs> But they do, uh, and uh, I, t I say, first off, I say who I am, and that uh, I try to sound very calm. You know, I just need uh, a unit to come to my location. Just, just non-emergency, just one car, please. And uh, uh, she says, no problem, officer. Uh, what's your location? And I realize, I don't know my location. <laughs> A cop that doesn't know his location, that's, you know, it's, it's really embarrassing. And uh, cause I don't know because I don't work in this precinct and I can't see any street signs, but I can see that uh, Pace University. I can see it, like I can see the logo on the wall and I, can, I say I'm near there and she says, that's fine, that's fine. Um, but one more thing, officer, I just need this for my report. What's, what's your situation? I say, uh, operator, I was hoping to not have to tell you that. Do I have to tell you? She's like, yes. And she's like, oh, wait, I know. And she seems to get it. She seems like she thinks she knows. She's like, oh, did you lock yourself out of your car? I said, no, I'm locked inside. <laughs> <clears throat> and she laughs just like that. And, uh, and, uh, but immediately, she's, like very, she's very genteel about it. She immediately puts me on hold, you know, so I don't have to hear her laughing at me. Um, <laughs> But the thing is, is when she, when she comes back from, on, from hold, I, can see, uh, I hear other laughing. You know, I can hear a whole audience laughing. And she's obviously told everybody in 911, I, I, I envision this like high-tech room with all these operators, with little headsets, and now, now they're all laughing about me. Um, <clears throat> um, so, uh, yeah, so I tell her, and she's like, don't worry about it, just relax. And I say, uh, okay, fine. Uh, and then I hang up the phone. And I go, <sighs> This, the hard part is over. You know, that was embarrassing. I think that's the worst of it. And then about a minute later, I hear a police siren off in the distance. And then another, and then another police siren. And I, and I start to see flashing lights, uh, you know, bouncing off of buildings. And I'm like, what happened? So I call 911 again, and I have to explain my whole situation. I'm that guy who's at the, and, uh, and they say, please hold. And they, when they come back from hold, they say, oh, well, officer, your, uh, your request for an additional unit was transmitted as a 1013. And a 1013, I say, that's the radio code for officer down. <laughs> that's like a cop has a knife at his throat or, or he's laying bleeding in the street and he's bleeding into the gutter. That's a 1013, not locked in the back of my car. <clears throat> 
And not only is this embarrassing because it's blown it up way out of proportion, it's, and there's no way I'm going to get away with this now, but um, it's really dangerous because uh, cops driving around uh, coming to each other's rescue, that's their favorite thing to do. It's like the only thing they like about being a cop is when another cop's in trouble and they can rush to their location because there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing to stop them. They can just drive as fast as they want. And now this is all happening on my behalf. And I have a vision of like somebody getting killed or hurt in the next day. It's going to be on the cover of the Daily News and the Post. It'll be my ID picture next to some dead person now. And uh, uh, I just think this is all going to be my fault. And uh, so I, I beg the operator, please call off the 1013. And she says she will. And then I hang up. And uh, I notice that <clears throat> my partner in the booth, uh, he's actually, all this activity has actually gotten him up. And he's moving around now. <laughs> And he's coming down the hill, and I, and he, I can tell he can't see which car I'm in, because he never really paid attention to where I went when I left for a meal. Um, so I take the radio off, or I'm sorry, I take my flashlight off the belt, and I, I shine it like I was doing it to before when he didn't see me. I'm like really trying to get his attention, and, and he takes his radio uh, flashlight off, and he shines it back at me and goes like this. <laughs> Like I'm like having some kind of fun flashlight time with him or something. And he just turns around and walks toward the booth and I knock on the window. Jesus Christ, I'm still fucking locked in here. Let me out. And he gets the point. He walks down the hill and it takes him two seconds. He just reaches down, lifts up my door handle. That's all I needed. And I'm free. Uh, but I'm not exactly in the clear yet, you see, um, because it's not for another five hours that I learn what my partner then tells me, um, which is that I'm not going to get in trouble for this. Nobody's going to find out, he insists, um, because he says, the only person that's going to put you on report for this is, uh, is your sergeant. And uh, if, you're, if you get in trouble, your sergeant gets in trouble for something called failure to supervise, right? So he's not going to get you in trouble. And as for your homies up in the 2 they're not going to find out either because these cops down in this precinct, that everybody knows. Now, everybody knows in the first precinct because uh, it, it went over the radio. But he says they look out for their sergeant here. They really like this guy, so they're not going to tell him. And, uh, and then uh, so when I'm in line uh, to get my overtime slip, signed out at the end of the night where all the other cops are like, oh, I'm going to make so much money off this. I have to be very contrite and very penitent when I walk up to the sergeant and I hand him my slip and, and uh, he looks at my name and he recognizes it. Oh, that's the kid that was locked in his car. And he signs it and he goes, here you go, Bacon, you're a legend. I mean, that's the only ribbing I get. That's the only ribbing I get. And, and, uh, and I know that nobody in the 2-8 precinct found out because I never heard about it. Because if, if one person found out, they'd all find out, and then they'd all dump on me. So they never find out, and they never will. Um, unless anybody here from the 2-8? <laughs> from my old squad? I didn't think so. OK, so my secret's safe, and that's my story. Thanks. Paul Bacon. You're a legend. <laughs>